Hey, what's up everyone? Mike here in the BFH garage getting ready to do a re-gear on a JK Rubicon. This has Data 44's front and rear. I've done TJ's in the past. I've been asked to do JK's. I'm telling you what, it is almost identical with the uh, exception of a couple things like the locker sensors you need to disconnect. But other than that, uh, fairly straightforward. Let's get busy on this thing. First thing we need to do is get the brakes, wheels, axle shafts, drive shaft, all that stuff separated and off, and then we'll get started. One of the first things I want to talk about is removing the drive shaft. These things are pain in the butt. You need to put some PB blast or coil, coil or something in the crease here. Once you get these bolts out of here, it doesn't just separate. You got to take a punch from the backside and start tapping it around, try to get the thing out of there. It's such a pain in the rear. So if you have any air tools, you can kind of, you know, jimmy up something to help you out. In this case here, You see it start to move. We get a little bit on every side. Once you get it all busted loose, come in here and get it out the rest of the way. You can see where it just gets all corroded and nasty in there. And that's why it becomes so difficult. Before we pull the locker out, you need to remove the locker sensor wire, which is attached back here. I'm gonna go around the other side and give you a better idea, but you have to disconnect this before pulling this out or you're gonna cause some damage. So let's get that out of there. So this plug is the easy one. It has a little push tab right there. You just push in and you're able to wiggle it. Oh, there we go. Wiggle that off. The difficult connection is the one that is here. These parts right here, this little sensor uh, lock bracket and all that become very brittle over time. And if you're not careful, you'll break tabs off very, very easily. Okay, here's what it looks like. You see it gets all that rust and everything in there, and if you try to pry up on this, you'll end up breaking it. So as it's in here, what I did is I started twisting it back and forth and slowly pull on it. And I tell you what, it's not easy. These things get jammed in there pretty good. So before you go to put it back together, get all that stuff cleaned up and make sure you put a little lubrication on that O-ring that's on that so that way it slides back in easier. Now this is the tough connector to get apart right here. As you look right here, there's a little tab and you have to detent that tab and pull out the sensor wires and it's a pain in the butt because these are usually brittle too. So not a great design, but it keeps it from coming apart while it's inside the diff. Just be careful. Once you get your locker wire disconnected, we're gonna pull the bearing cap bolts right here. part that fell off. This is what's used to retain this. So as it sits there, it fits in this little slot. If you don't, this thing will turn and break. And so every time you, you set up and you want to check pattern, you have to put this retainer back on there. Otherwise that'll spin and you'll, you'll end up with uh, issues. Um, you've seen my previous videos. Look for the stamp on the side of the housing. This one here is a sideways S. This one over here has an S. And if you look on the bearing caps, you're going to find the letter that corresponds. Make sure you keep them oriented the right way and on the correct side. You see how loose this locker is? It wants to just fall right out, which is um, not a good thing. But since we're re-gearing it, we're not going to have any issues. But what you do need to be careful of is that as you go to remove your bearing cap bolts like this, this thing could fall right out on you. Look, this thing just wants to come right out and we don't want to see that fall onto the ground. Normally it takes a lot more effort than that to get that thing to fall out of the housing. So bearings are probably worn pretty good. Um, whatever, it's what it is, we're gonna make it right. All right, here's my new rebuild kit. I have a new ring and pinion, 
make sure the numbers are matching and that they are in the correct rotation. There's nothing worse than getting bearings pressed on and realize you have the wrong ring and pinion. Um, comes all the bearings, shims and all that stuff. I have to go through and mark them still. They sent two different versions of ring gear bolts, so depending on the backside of this, and it's, it's drilled uh, both ways, so it depends on what the Rubicon housing is. Give you new seals, new crush sleeve, all that stuff. So I'm gonna go get the ring gear in the oven, get it heated up so it slides over easier and we can get it set onto the locker. When you take your ring gear bolts off, pull them all out with the exception of two, just loosen them pretty good and then let your ring gear drop. You may have to poke through one of the other holes to get it to maybe, you know, tap it to get it to drop, but you don't want it to drop down onto your locker sensor there, so. Love me some Milwaukee tools. You see how it dropped and now you, you can just take out those other two bolts without dropping it onto the uh, sensor. So we're going to get that off there and then next we'll take off the bearings. I almost forgot to mention that uh, you have to take your bearings off in order to get this magneto off of here. So uh, before you can move your ring gear, we have to get that bearing off. A couple ways you can do that, you could either use a clamshell puller or you can go old school if you don't have one because clamshell pullers are expensive. Take a Dremel with a cutoff wheel, cut the cage here and there, spread that apart, let all the tapered rollers fall out, and then take your Dremel and continue to grind a slot into your cone. And eventually what you're going to have to do is lay it on its side hit it with a cold chisel to pop that race and make it break. But you don't want to, uh, you don't want to take your cutoff wheel and get it into the actual journal of the uh, locker. That's bad. So take a little bit of time, a little bit of a time, try to pop with the chisel, do it until you can, and then it'll come right off. It takes a lot of time, but it is one way to get it done. Um, I have since uh, invested in a clamshell puller. You take the stem, you put it there, you set the puller here, you adjust the bottom collar till it lines right up. Uh, before you do that, actually, you need to have the race on. Then I'm going to put this on. You're going to adjust this bottom adjusting collar till it lays flat on the race. Then you're going to take your clamshell, adjust your upper one till it makes contact. Put it on like so. Take your retaining collar, slide it on. I just did a video on this. And then you use your impact, it'll pull right off. Makes short work of that for sure. And the nice thing about it is if you're doing a job that you want to keep the bearing, that once you pull it off, the bearing comes out completely intact, you can reuse it. So it makes really short work. Now something you need to pay attention to here, there's a little ring here that comes off and you'll notice that it's got a bevel going this way you want to maintain the bevel the same way so that's going to come off i'm going to set it right here then this magneto pops off keep that in the same orientation now my ring gear i'll have to turn over and pop it again to get it to come down but now my ring gear will fit over the top of that just like that So now that I got that out of the way, I can set it up and do the same thing for this bearing.
like that. Have the other bearing off. So really nice to have around the shop if you tend to do a lot of gears with your friends or whatever. It might be worth investing in one of those. They, they cost three, four hundred bucks, something like that. Um, they're not cheap, but man, they sure make short work of that. With the bearings off, you want to get everything cleaned up. Now I'm going to tell you what, you need to pay attention to some of this stuff because as I'm cleaning here, I use brake clean and some of this stuff is still sticking above the surface and I have to, I can't even get it with my fingernail, so I'm going to have to take something that's abrasive there to get that off of there. But you want your ring gear to sit completely flush to that flange and with that kind of debris there, it would make it offset, which would uh, cause problems during your setup. So make sure you go over the flange of your locker as well as the backside of the ring gear. And you want to do the ring gear before it's in the oven, but you want to uh, make sure that's completely flat. Now we need to remove the pinion. One of these tools is kind of nice. I took and welded mine up so that way I don't have to sit there and play the game of bend it like I did there. But you put that over, insert your bolts through the holes, and this spanner will hold it in place so you can use brute force with the cheater bar to break this nut free. The other option, good old Milwaukee tools. I love these things. Take your nut, put it back on just a couple of threads, and then you're going to drive the pinion out. Well, my pinion bearing is seized to the pinion itself, so I'm going to get back after that here in a minute to get that thing removed. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and set the ring gear. A lot of people bypass this step, and that is brake cleaning your ring gear bolts. They come with the packing oil or packing grease on there, and you'll read where people have had ring gear bolts back out because um, it's attributed to that the Loctite doesn't stick to the oil and everything that's in there. So I cleaned out the ring gear real good. I cleaned up the bolts real good. Now I'm going to get some red Loctite on there and they should hold just fine. You don't want to pull the ring gear up onto the shoulder using the ring gear bolts. These ring gear bolts are one time use only. I know some people reuse them, but they're not designed for that. They actually have an elasticity, they stretch, and uh, they're, they're designed to hold in place that way. So once you undo them, they lose that ability. So always use new ring gear bolts. All right, well I contemplate how I'm gonna get that pinion out of there. I'm going to apply the carrier bearings and uh, get those pressed on. So remember, you have to get these pieces on before you press that other side. So I'm gonna start by pressing this side first, then I'm gonna turn it over, and then press on the other side, putting on those components. All right, pressing on the bearing. You can see how it's set up here. I'll do this side first, then I'll flop it so that way the locker mechanism, the magnet, can you know, use gravity to hold it in place. One of the things I'm going to do first, take a little bit of grease, put it around the journal. That way we don't end up with a seized bearing like we have on the pinion currently. So that's where that goes. We're going to set this here. I use an old race. That way this can still spin freely and we're not gonna we're not gonna damage that. And then on top of that, I put a little piece of flat stock. Make sure everything's lined up. And we start pressing her on. You're gonna notice a couple things here. Number one, I have a used cone on the bottom. Remember, I used to cut them off, so I have a bunch of these laying around, and that is designed to push on the cone so this bearing can spin freely. Up top, I have the bearing up here, and I have another cone inverted upside down, pressing against that. Now, when I press this on, that bearing's gonna start going. 
and I should have free rotation down there and up here. The other thing you're going to notice is that I got my locker magnet on as well as that spacer that was there. Make sure your bearings are oriented. There's a lot of things to think about before you start pressing things on. Make sure they're oriented in the right way or you're going to be pulling them off. that comes off. Well, I've never had a pinion this seized before, so in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and get the seal removed out of here. All you got to do is you got to take a screwdriver, get it right on the edge, and start caving the seal into itself. You work your way around until it pops off. As you can see, the inside of that pinion bearing is completely rusted, seized up pretty good on the pinion itself. Um, I took some heat to it uh, prior to hitting it that last time and it got it to move. So I decided to add a little bit more heat to it. And as you saw, it come out with one good uh, blow there. So sometimes that's your only option to get that stuff out is to take a torch, heat it up. And what happens is the metal expands and it breaks that uh, connection between the rust and the other parts of the metal. So. Give it a good whack and out she'll come. Next we need to knock out these races. And if you look inside here, let me see if I can get all this same time here. You're going to see this little lip right there. And that little lip, you need to take a punch and work around in a circular pattern until that race comes out. You got to get your BFH out. You got to beat on a little bit and eventually it's going to pop right out. You'll see here in just a second. Then you're going to turn around and do it from this way and you'll see the other lip from the other side on the inside here. It really doesn't matter which one you do first, but they both have to come out. I like to use this bar. I keep it flat on one side and it grabs the, uh, the edges real nice. <laughs> kind of hard work with the light right in my face. Alright, that was the inner race. Now you're going to see the outer race It'll pop out from that perspective. Since we're already on the back side, I've cleaned out the housing already this uh, and you want to make sure you get this thing completely clean on the inside I've gotten all the old seal parts off I have the entire inside there cleaned out wiped out brake clean the whole nine yards now it's time to press in the outer race this race doesn't come back out it goes in one time so we'll put it in now you want to start them straight because once they go crooked it's a pain in the rear I say that every time, you guys probably laugh at me. At least I don't have my fat head in the video this time. Boy, that one started nice. And the reason I can't continue with this one is because it's beveled there and it just won't fit. And I was afraid if I started with this one, it might've got offset. So that's the only reason. So now I have to keep it dead on and just be careful.
There's a couple different ways to adjust pinion depth. You can use the inner race and actually put shims behind it. And what that does is every time you put shims behind it, it moves that race forward. It moves the, the entire pinion forward, which makes it deeper into the ring gear. If you need to go shallower, then you take shims out and it slides back and it becomes shallower. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to take shims and you put them between the pinion head and the inner pinion bearing. And that does the same thing. The pinion head dries uh, in as you add shims and it uh, gets a little more shallow as you take shims out. So either way is correct. Most people don't have uh, clamshell bearing pullers. Those are expensive. So the more optimum way to do it on a budget is to get a brand new bearing exactly like uh, the one you're going to use. And you're going to hone around the outside and make what's called a setup bearing. You want to keep sanding that outside. You could use a Dremel with a, uh, with a uh, sanding disc on it. You can use all sorts of things, but you just want to make sure you get a nice even um, amount taken off. And you want to take off enough that it slides right inside the housing there and it slides in place where it would be under normal circumstances. And what that allows you to do is to take this race back out, add or subtract your shims, put this back in. It makes it really easy for setup. After you determine what your pinion depth needs to be, then you keep that amount of shims, you get your, your new race, and you, uh, see, or you uh, drive that into place with the shims behind there, and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. In my case, I'm going to drive the new bearing race in, and I'm gonna make all of my adjustments at the pinion head. Um, now that I have a clamshell bearing puller, it makes it easy to get that thing off. Um, it is a little more time consuming uh, putting the, the uh, bearing back on. However, I have a pretty good starting point, so it shouldn't take more than uh, one or two tries to get the reading that I need. So I'm going to go ahead and drive this one in. And unlike last time, I actually have a driver that fits this one appropriately. That one wasn't much better. The only reason I did that, and the only reason I care of getting that pinion off, even though we're not reusing it, is this guy right here. That's my starting shim for my pinion depth on my next setup. Now that we have the pinion all ready to go with the bearing, we have to get that in place. Got to put in the tail bearing. From there. Now, the one thing that um, I remember as I pulled this out is that this locker fell right out. So, with new bearings, I'm hoping that it, it adds the preload back and it was just worn bearings causing it to fall out. So, we'll try that with the original shims and then we'll see if it's got enough preload. Now as you go to put this in, be careful that you're not damaging that. Now you see how that just falls right in, falls right out. That means I don't have enough preload. I'll have to add a shim. I'll be adding an additional 10,000 shim. See if I can take up that slack in the preload. And that's just a random number. You can pick whatever you want. You just got to figure out if you're getting there or not.
So before we check backlash, you need to reinstall your bearing caps. You can tighten these down finger tight. I use a drill with a clutch and it, it puts it in and then stops it right there, keeps it nice and firm. You can hear that we have backlash, so that's good. You're gonna take your dial indicator, you're gonna set it here. Make sure that it's off the back side of the tooth below it. You want to make sure too you have your tooth that has a beveled edge and then it has a flat side. Beveled edge is your coast side, the flat side is your drive side. You want to take your readings from your drive side. So looking at that I have three thousandths backlash. That's not enough to put it in spec. So what I need to do is remove all of this again and adjust my shims to open up that backlash. That means I need to add shims to this side, take away some shims to this side. One or two thousandths of an inch right now should put me into spec. Uh, real quick, another trick now that we have preload on here, this carrier will not just pull straight out. A lot of people talk about putting a crowbar, taking a rag and all those things. Here is the most easy, effective way to do this. You take a wrench, that is the size of your ring gear bolt. And you start turning your pinion, which moves the ring gear up here. Your wrench catches and it walks right out. Super, super easy. With shims adjusted. Oh, I hate this because it tears up your fingers as you try to install this. Sounds like good backlash. We have it seated all the way. Time to get the bearing caps on and uh, take another reading. Let's get the dial indicator back up. Right at 7,000, so that's within spec. So now the next step is to put paint on here and take a pattern. You don't ever want to take a pattern without having your backlash in spec. It does you no good. So remember, you always want to put on your retaining uh, collar here so this doesn't spin or you're going to tear this thing up. So let's get some paint on this and see what we got. So real quick to talk about the paint. The paint normally comes in a really uh, thick consistency. Mix it with some gear oil and that will allow it to spread out more evenly and give you a better pattern. The other thing too is some people sit here and manually rotate the pinion back there back and forth a number of times and it's a lot of manual work. I like to take my same drill, put it on the pinion nut and then put pressure on the ring gear with the glove and what that does is it applies resistance to the ring gear so when it goes through the pinion gear the resistance causes them to mesh better. So you want to go forward and backwards. Now let's bring it around to our paint, wherever that may be. Wow, and just like that, you know what, it's amazing. So when you start, 
with the original shim stack, you got to understand that an aftermarket pinion versus an OEM pinion, you're talking one, two, three thousandths of an inch different. So that's why I always start with the OEM shim first. If you look here, that gave us a perfect pattern first time out in backlash. So look at that. Excellent. I'm absolutely good with that pattern, so we can move on now to uh, getting everything else all finished up, which means we need to set the pinion with the seal, and uh, we got to get the plunger uh, spread apart, and I'll show you that little trick here in just a second. So right now, all I need to do is pull everything out, and we'll go from there. I have people ask me all the time, how do you know this pattern is good? When you're interpreting patterns, you want this pattern to be centered on the tooth and centered uh, from top land into the root, but you don't want to be too deep in the root. An indicator that you're too deep in the root is you get a harsh line towards the root. Here you can see the patterns diffuse all the way around. One of the things you want is a little thin line right at the top of the tooth that shows that your uh, pinion's not riding off of the tooth. All right, JKs are a little bit different. They have this big old honking uh, uh, yoke here that makes it difficult to get this started onto that pinion because this bearing here goes inside. Because it doesn't press easily right down onto that, you have to get it started first. And to do that, you gotta give it a couple whacks of the dead blow hammer to get this started. Then you could take your, your old nut and you could drive this down a little bit and then you could tap your yoke back off that's when I like to install the seal. If you install the seal first, then the problem you're going to have is you're trying to whack on that yoke to get it set, and you could uh, inadvertently tear your seal. You'll see what I'm talking about here in just a second. All right, so I'm going to grab my pinion, coming from this side. Before I do that, actually, I'm going to make sure I install my spacer, my, my crush sleeve. get that set that way right there. Now what I want to do is take this bearing, put it there, take my, my uh, thrust washer, put it there, and I'm going to set this on the top. Now if you notice there's barely any room for that nut to start. So we we'll give it a couple wax. And that will allow me to start the old nut And now that that's on there, what I'll do is I'll take my impact, I'll drive it on, then I'm going to take and tap this back out. So I don't need to drive it on all the way, I just need to make sure that I get it far enough on there that once I put the seal on, I can get the nut back on and uh, make sure I, I press it the rest of the way without damaging the seal. Now that I have that driven on there, I'm going to take the nut off, I'm going to take my BFH, get my yoke off of there. Now, uh, one thing I want to make sure I do too is I install a new pinion nut. You always want to use a new nut. Time to get the seal on now. So as you can see, that's still loose, but it's out of my way. So I can get the seal pressed on, but before I do that, I want to line that lip full of grease. That way there's no friction on the pinion. Now that I have the pinion seal in, I'll put some grease around the yoke. I'm going to slowly slide that on. Fit it right through the seal. Now I don't have to sit there and fight that as I'm putting it on. So I'm going to take my new pinion washer and new pinion nut. I'm going to start those. And one quick note on these nuts. This is what's called a Stover type nut. When you look at it, you can see that it's oblong. And that's designed that way. So as you tighten it up, it expands out to the roundness. Here it's oblong. And what it does, these crimps here make it that way and it clamps down and locks onto your pinion to keep it from backing off. 
That's why you always hear me harp about always using a new pinion nut every time you take it apart. These are designed for one time use and uh, if you do more than that then they're liable to fall off and you're going to end up with your pinion coming loose and creating more uh, damage inside your differential. So as I start to tighten this, I want to get the play out of the pinion. I'm going to finish it up with a uh, normal wrench and a cheater bar. So you have a couple options. One is either use an impact the entire way or you can use one of these spanners. So I have a spanner. Normal these come with just this part and you can put a pipe on there, but you see how well that worked out for me. So what I did is I just welded on a whole, I think it's a half inch flat stock piece and it's not moving at all now. So with the crush sleeve, like I said, it's easy to over tighten these, so you got to take those in small increments. So now that I have it tightened up, I'm going to check my, my uh, pinion preload. Now this is in inch pounds, not foot pounds, and you need to understand that it doesn't include the torque that it takes to get it to go. It's once you get it rotating, it's the torque value at that point. I shoot for 16 to 20. If it's over by a couple pounds, I'm not going to change out the crush sleeve, but I shoot for that 16 to 20 range just because it's a good target for me. In this case here, I'm right at 22, so I'm just over that 20, and I'm fine with that. This thing's good to go. With the pinion all set, now it's time to put the carrier back in, but there's a couple things we need to prep before we put the carrier in. Number one, this plunger here. This is... Um, when you pull the locker out, this falls behind the flange that it's supposed to be on. So in order to reinstall your locker, you need to make a device. This one here I use, it's just a little piece of wood and I have it attached to a piece of wire. Thank you JJVW for that one. Um, anyway, you pull the plunger out and you stick this piece of uh, dowel behind it. What that does, it holds the plunger out and when you stick your locker in and then you pull this, then it allows it to re-engage at the correct spot. So make sure you install one of these prior to putting in your locker. And I would take a flashlight as well once your, your locker is installed. Look over the top and make sure that this is still intact because you don't want to accidentally knock it out and not figure it out until after you get everything buttoned up. So take care of putting that back in. Now the other thing I want to uh, uh, tell you right now is as you go to put the locker back in, make sure you route that sensor wire back up through the hole because once you get everything in, you're not going to have that much room to try to finagle that in there. So as you're installing the locker, it's easier to try to run that sensor up right at that moment in time. Um, another thing back to the uh, plunger here, make sure you route that wire all the way back and around and keep it low so that way you're not accidentally hitting it as you're installing that locker.
Once you're certain that the locker is fully seated, put your bearing caps back on, making sure that orientation is correct. I like to put this bearing cap on before I apply this thing and just make sure it's seated all the way. I can tap on it without hurting this thing. Check, make sure your backlash is good. That sounds good. I'll check it again uh, when I'm all done. Next thing I'm going to do is go through and torque the four bearing cap bolts to spec. And then I'm going to double check everything. I also need to hook up my sensor wire up here. It's sticking out on the backside right there. So I'll make sure I get that connected properly and uh, reinstalled. And that should just about wrap it up. I'll run another pattern just to make sure everything is solid. Sitting right at seven, perfect. So we're ready to run a pattern, but the first thing I wanna do is make sure that that plunger stayed out, and it did. So I'm gonna remove this now so the plunger what basically what it does is this little thin piece here on the back side, the plunger needs to stay to this side of it. If you go to install your locker and that plunger is not pushed out, then you're either going to damage the plunger or it's not going to operate correctly. So that's there. Now we can run a pattern. And then I'm going to come back and connect that wire and everything. So let's run a pattern first and see what we get. Perfect. All right, we're on the home stretch. We want to make sure that we get this locker wire locked in place. <clears throat> make sure it uh, clips in, and then we gotta be really careful reinserting this thing. Remember what I talked about getting some, some oil, I'm gonna put it around that O-ring. And that will help lube it for going in there without tearing up that o-ring. So now as you go to put this thing in, you're going to want to push and turn back and forth as you install it to get it to go. Once you make sure everything's lined up, reinstall your 5 16 bolt. And then secure your locker back. Make sure that you hear that click. While we're back here, we'll go ahead and get the drive shaft reattached. Well, that's gonna do it for this video. Everything's all set. All we need to do is put the diff cover on, fill it full of gyro. Still need to slide the axle shafts back in and get those secured, but that's easy work. Um, hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, post them down below. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe.